President, the Chairman, I would like to start by invoking the spirit of Leo Beck in the darkest nights of the World War and the Holocaust, and I quote, when one world goes, another comes, but the generations abide forever. With all due respect to the distinguished gathering, this colloquy is not about us. It's about the millions of people in our region who hope for a better future in these difficult times. I want to say that years ago, I had the privilege of shaking hands with Shimon Peres in the White House. And I believe I addressed him in Hebrew. And to our surprise, we were applauded by President Clinton and Vice President Al Gore. And I turned to Bill Clinton and Al Gore and said, I hope the day will come when Shimon will respond in Arabic. I would like to thank you, Shimon, for hosting me in your home in the days of euphoria when we could break bread together and when your late wife made her specialty of honeyed chicken. But today, life is more serious than it ever was in our search for peace. Today, it is a time for war and a time for peace. Et milchama ve'et shalom. May I say that in deciding to address your conference today, I had to overrule many objections by my family and friends. Some of you could say I take the wrong advice. By advisors, by directors of organizations I had, and even by many Israeli peace activists. Of course, as for my own feelings, I believe that peace has never been an easy ride for any of us. Today I expect to be attacked by all sides for being either radically moderate or offensively realistic. But I note that according to the title of this year's conference, we all stand in the eye of the storm. And in Jordan, few of us take pleasure in that fact. I, like many of you, gathered here today, am not a novice when it comes to peace efforts between Arabs and Israelis. I've spent so many years trying to achieve a lasting and honorable settlement to the decades-old conflict. But in commenting on what the President just said, let me say that in the spirit of the founder of the State of Israel, Chaim Weizmann, that conviviality between Arabs, Christian, Muslim, and Jew existed for longer than conflict, but nationalism, as both of you have rightly pointed out, both you and the founder of the State of Israel, Mr. President, nationalism has resulted in governments not only losing power, but also losing the willpower to develop from cosmopolitan to convivial Middle East. Incidentally, the title of your conference is Israel and the Middle East. May I suggest that we speak, without presuming on anyone, of Israel in the Middle East. You spoke of the importance of ideas and I would like to say that since 9-11, the concept of conviviality in our region and in the world, of the expression of the desire to live in peace with one's neighbors, has been hijacked by the international security establishment, which has focused our minds on the war on terror. To some of us in this region, 
it appears that the security agenda is another form of a colonial agenda. To the extent that it has silenced many Israelis and many Arabs who still in their hearts hope for and wish for peace. Inner peace, ladies and gentlemen, not only internet, but internet. We review the policies and the actions of governments in office and the ideologies of their constituent members and we can see why there's that resistance to promoting the noble art of conversation, which I personally have always believed is not a martial art. Addressing the broader issues of the region in a full peace process may be a Helsinki process, and I congratulate Foreign Minister Timoya of Finland on reviving this peace process is surely a framework we should consider. Security falls into three categories. Basic security, as in weapons of mass destruction. Current security, as in acts of violence of all kinds, but also what is more important, human dignity in the context of socio-economic development. And I would agree with the president when he says the basic problem that we face in our region, uh, West Asia, North Africa region, is famine. Yet, I have to add that in terms of our priorities, our emphasis on security is security for us and insecurity for others. Seven countries in this region are the top spenders on the purchase of arms. ARMS, ladies and gentlemen, not ALMS. I wish the latter were true. I wish we could bring a smile to the faces of 750,000 children who are vulnerable to disease in Yemen today, or to those refugees in Somalia and many other parts of the region. We witness what is happening on the ground in the occupied territories and the way that negotiations are being conducted in Amman today, where Jordan plays the role, yet again, of a host for such negotiations between Palestinians and Israelis. And you will not fail to see the logic of those who have objected to my decision to address you today. At the cost of sounding patronizing or possibly utterly simplistic, I want to tell you very honestly and frankly what I feel about this conference and how, if its sole focus is to be on security, it cannot bring us an inch closer to security and peace in the region as a whole. May I say that I truly believe a simple truth, and that is that it is a law of diminishing returns which says that the more we spend on armaments, the less we feel secure. I remember an American congressman years ago saying to me, well, folks like you are bad for business. I said, well, I don't do business anyway, and if that is your definition of business, then let me remind you, ladies and gentlemen, of the following. The opportunity cost of conflict in terms of income lost since the failure of the Madrid Conference until 2010 was calculated by the Mumbai-based Strategic Foresight Group as 12, 12 trillion dollars. Every single country in this region has lost out irrespective of its political perspectives. The per capita income of all countries would have been doubled were it not for the futility of war. Current international efforts to prevent the development and proliferation of WMD are destabilizing the region. For some of us, it would be preferable and more realistic to work towards turning the Middle East, Israel, and the Indian subcontinent, and indeed North Korea, into a WMD free zone. I believe that Ephraim Halevi of Shasha Center framed today 
has recently put pen to paper on this subject and I would remind him that in the days of the negotiations between Jordan and Israel, we called for a CSCME, a conference for security and cooperation in the Middle East, which I prefer to call today the West Asian region. I say that simply because some of my American friends remind me that the Middle East is from Marrakesh to Bangladesh, from Casablanca to Calcutta, I, I believe in broad brush strokes, but I think that's a little too broad, even for my understanding. Like so, else, so much else in our region, the road to arms control has been paved with good intentions and little else. The practical work done as part of the arms control and regional security process has recently, has virtually been forgotten. At the same time, there have been a long series of calls for eliminating weapons of mass destruction, all of which have done more to serve political purposes than reflect a genuine interest in arms control. Despite this, this region, the Middle East region, remains a world laboratory for new kinds of weaponry, from nuclear to biological, cyber, radiological, and neurological threats. We are a breeding ground for rogue, extremist, and non-state actors. In 2009, President Obama devised a three-part strategy to address the international nuclear threat, proposing measures to reduce and eventually eliminate nuclear arsenals, to strengthen the NPT and halt proliferation of nuclear weapons, and to prevent terrorists from acquiring nuclear weapons or materials. Allow me to be perfectly clear, as a member of the Nuclear Threat Initiative, chaired by Sam Nunn, with the distinguished participation of George Schultz, Henry Kissinger, Secretary Perry, Ted Turner, and others, let me be perfectly clear, a poly-nuclear Middle East is in no one's interest. There is no bilateral solution. According to one Herzliya report, you describe a multipolar nuclear Middle East. I believe that this cannot be achieved through co confrontation. It can only be postponed by it. At NTI, we worked with the government of Kazakhstan, with the U.S. Energy Department, on ending highly enriched uranium, HEU development, and on focusing on low enriched uranium, LEU. What was possible in Kazakhstan and now in the Ukraine is possible within West Asia and North Africa, if the issue is a single item agenda. As I said at the Weapons of Mass Destruction Commission in Cairo, in the presence of Israeli colleagues years ago, when Hans Blix was chairing that commission, Dimona in Israel is just up the road from us.